Yeah. Right? So, Estelle, <laughs> so Estelle is originally from Australia, and I'm sure a lot of people want to want to attend, wanted to attend this. Some people wrote to me that they wanted to attend this, but they were not able to because of the time lapse. So I'm going to record this, and then you will be able to see the talk on our website and maybe on YouTube. So yeah. I start from Australia, but right now in Berlin, I'm passing through Paris from time to time, and maybe for a longer time when this book was maybe conceived. We're going to talk about this a little bit later. So, Pisti 80 Rue de Belleville, it's uh, both a name and an address. And um, Pisti is, uh, the, um, is the heroine. Uh, can you see the heroine? Or like the yeah, heroine? I don't, I mean, she's, I'm not sure I'd call her the heroine, but yeah, I like it. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, maybe she's the heroine of the book. Um, I would like to start this in a very simple, uh, matter of fact uh, way, maybe with a, a small reading of the first chapters from you, Estelle, and then we can discuss a little bit about yeah, the content of the book and uh, people that inhabit it. Um, Sounds think? good. Starting the next to read. Yeah. yeah, sure. I thought maybe I could just read from the start yeah. um, for like 10 minutes or something so that people don't get bored. Although if people do get bored, we won't know about it because we don't have to watch everyone leaving the room. So it actually works well on Zoom <laughs> for us. But um, okay, so I'll start. <clears throat> Oral intercourse, Paris Austerlitz to Carez, one adult, to part 841. I met a woman covertly anti-intellectual. We had a meager breakfast of stale bread and pickles dipped in black coffee. She served the coffee in secondhand sauces covered in yellow and blue roses. She'd been having occasional sex with a conservative who recently liberated herself from her Catholic school upbringing. Neither of them could agree on anything political, but enjoyed their burgeoning sexuality nonetheless. They would lie on a mattress on the floor in floral nighties and book nights away at sleazy hotels to keep things interesting. The year before she'd lived abroad in an anarchist community in the outskirts of Berlin that put hairs in her chest in all the right ways. She asked me if I was familiar with Dada. I told her I was fond of Hannah Herk and that I'd written her one time. She seemed to like me more after that. She tells me it's her third attempt in overcoming depression in that overly effete way people do when talking about depression. She burned the toast but scraped it forcefully and threw it underneath me. She was disillusioned with the intellectual left and I, similarly weary, listened to her bemoan England's betrayal of representative democracy. She was from Budapest but antsy to reinforce. From Pest, not Buda, always Pest, flat like a prairie. She called herself Pisti and planned to talk, take a course in pre-revolutionary Russian literature at Berkeley the following year, intending not to pay. I nodded. I was too busy dipping burnt toast into burnt coffee. Breakfast talk moved to Brexit and she quoted me Jenny Holzer, but without citing Jenny Holzer. I wondered how often she'd gotten away with this. Ruin your fucking self before they do. Otherwise they'll screw you because you're a nobody. They'll keep you alive, but you'll have to crawl and say thank you for every bone they throw. It was too early for a Trotskyite political meeting, so I sighed in agreement and stared at the table in hope another Klaus and pickle would be served. It wasn't. Far from being complicit in Brexit, but too tired to embark on any sort of comparison with the Bolsheviks' betrayal of the revolution, I looked greedily for my very own exit. I walked over to the stove and put some water in a saucepan and a few clumps of Ayurvedic tea, hoping it might sort out her yang excess or chi or whatever. I'm on the early train to Karez, I said. It's too far for where I'm actually going, Trenyak. Far enough that I have to settle in a little, but not so far that I can stop being aware. I think it's a nice tension and I love things a little fraught. She looked at me with dark Eastern European eyes before rolling them unsubtly. I am too provocative for you, I see that. Francesca told me you were political, but I see a lack of limberness. I hope you have an encounter with liberation. I also hope you'll fuck me when you come back to Paris. She picked up a paper and began rolling a morning cigarette. I found her intolerable and was about to tell her, 
but the yogi tea boiled up in the pot, reminding me of what a shitty person I was. I poured the tea and completed her Jenny Holzer quote ironically. You'll be left alone if you're frightening and dead if you're free. You can change the radiant child in you to a reflection of the shit you were meant to serve. I washed my saucer in cool water. I guess it's better to be misunderstood than understood too well. Pisty wore a black skivvy almost exclusively, thin without being wafy and had an under undercut as was custom in hipster Parisian circles. Her skin was suggestively olive, but it was difficult to tell under all the hectic black. She was immodest both inside and outside the apartment, frequently sprawled out unclothed on the mattress, splintered white floorboards, kitchen sink. She was listless when she smoked, staring out over the 19th arrondissement, sighing limply. She was most likable in her slothful moments, a momentary reprieve from her feverish rants over politics, art, sex, mostly sex. I could not waste my vagina sucking a penis, she would spit in thick Hungarian English. My cunt knows no boundary but this. I listened to her dull, repetitive tirades about her disdain for all things phallic and her obsession with likening her lover's cunts to and oysters. They are translucent, somewhat irregular in shape, but still a delicacy. Etymological musings of the word oyster would follow through the old French oyster to the feminine Austria in the Latin. I can teach anyone to love the saltiness of French oysters, even you. She sucked in hard on her cigarette and spread her legs apart just a little from her naked perch on the sink. She asked me if I had a lover and if I was pleased with them. I told her yes and yes. She asked me if I had emotions. You seem to have more curiosity of emotion than emotion itself. I think your heart has been a coward for too long. Her voice was flat but not morose and I found myself wondering if she was more insightful than I bargained. You love cock, I see that. I could tell she thought I was prudish but I wasn't in the mood to reveal myself to someone who'd already decided who I was. It seemed primitive. The light grew long over white floorboards and conversation even longer. The floorboards now spilling over with muscadet that Pisty had stolen from the local car for, along with homemade lemon hummus and radish. I fingered through the pile of literature she'd brought and found, surprisingly, my fondness for her growing. Posthumous works of Simone Weil caught in the folds of white sheets in their bed. Gravity and grace grappling for freedom from bedded entrapment. She watched me curiously, eyes darting a little from too much muscadet. She mused, if one more person tells me how terrific my life is, I'm going to give up eating. Simone Weil did that once. I guess it could only be once. She spoke ancient Greek by 10, precocious. Self-declared Bolshevik by 12, exacting. Male anarchist stops eating, it's called political activism. Female anarchist stops eating, it's called anorexia, haughty divisions of labour. To be rooted is perhaps the most important and least recognised need of the human soul, I retaliated. She smiled knowingly and I knew we were talking about different things. Caballero Cosima and the European Finals, en route. Pisty announced she was catching the early train with me to Trenyak. She decided to come to the residency project and make a short 16 mil film, uninvited. It wasn't that I wanted to get rid of her, at least not anymore, but Francesca had warned me of Pisty's intemperance and I was in much need of composure. I wasn't bothered by a lot of things. I simply had little left to deal with ascetic post-war economic debates and the steady castration of all penal humans. Ordinarily, I'd have found it thrilling, commissioned it even. But my year had been filled with archaic red tape, the pressures of motherhood and long haul flights, and I was fantasizing about quiet afternoons in a rundown summer place. But PC became so aroused by the idea of an artist run initiative, no manner of dissuasion would suffice. I was hijacked. Francesca walked into the apartment that moment, buried beneath calico bags of stolen cheese and pommes de terre from Aldi. I wondered why she didn't go somewhere more upscale if she was gonna steal anyway. 
Francesca flopped down on the mattress and pulled a Gallimard paperback out from underneath her. She flicked through the book a bit before settling on a page. It was the copy, it was the copy of Gravity and Grace. She dramatised. Human existence is so fragile a thing and exposed to such dangers that I cannot love without trembling. She craned her neck to look at Pisty and butted thick lashes theatrically. Pisty stared at her, cruelly, replying flatly, I love you, baby. I don't want to fuck anybody else. As hypocritical as I found her, I couldn't help but feel a narrow tenderness towards Pisty, a delicate tenderness that could be dashed at any moment. Franny and I shared a long history of narrow left-wing politics and inflammatory poetry. We started a reading group in Paris on the northeast periphery some years before that was a replication of one she'd started at the San Fran Art Institute. She was less sophisticated than Pisty, but warmer and more considered, with hip-length hair blonde and wavy. We conspired to screen left propaganda videos in the guise of art documentary at Cavaliero Cosima in the Belleville Hills, a cooperatively run contemporary art space with publishing house attached. We didn't quite know how to facilitate the discussions, but Franny had me modest infatuation with one of the filmmakers there. So our programming continued. Despite worshipping the femme filmmaker from Cavaliero Cosima, Franny was predominantly interested in women. She and Pisty were relatively new, but relatively serious. I was happy to see Franny fulfilled, at least momentarily, and her carefree nature met Pisty's hostility nicely. The sexual tension in the room was cinematic, shots of great sexual fluency, triumphant European railway scenes from some underground Polish cinephile like Marcel Wazinski. Their fucking was loud and howling, fawning over one another to the exclusion of everyone else. They cajoled one another with a steadfast allegiance to Italian delicacies and tropes, dry hung salami, olive oil and sel de mer, regular motifs in their lovemaking. I sat by the windowsill with a light joint and a bottle of pepper Malbec watching the scene. They're a good pairing. Rosé light drew longer into the evenings. Vincent's Boulangerie now open till 9 p.m. Low rent cafe named Petit Po opened for a pero and a screening of the 2016 European football, Portugal versus England on flickering analog. I wondered if this would be England's last ever game. Do you want me to keep going? Well, that's, that's enough. Uh-oh. I can't hear you anymore. You've muted it. I'll keep going. Okay, okay, good, good. We're having the political agenda. Okay, she's showing me the political agenda. A hard-on for Armageddon. It was becoming more and more difficult to catch reality. Pisty's caustic words persisted with frequency in low-heeled canvas espadrilles. She'd take a tiny walk up to the fridge, peer in, walk away empty-handed. She colonised the space, owning every inch of the white floorboards, dully unimpressed by my luggage compressed against the side of the wall. I rearranged them dutifully as though they could become less obtrusive to her in some way. They couldn't. Sexual hydraulics surrendered to practical conversation around dinner plans. Fluids had been damned, estuary slowed, oil and salt returned to the kitchen air. Franny placed the dried salami back on a steel S-shaped butcher's hook. I hoped we weren't eating hydraulics for dinner. The cisterns hissed chronically, apparent recurrence at 9 p.m. So Pisty raised her voice to drone instructions over the top. We will have call for a meeting, a political meeting over supper. We will be punctual. And with that, she walked straight out of the apartment and disappeared down Rue de Pyrenees. A prescriptive silence fell over the co-location, as was fashionable in Paris. A quiet moment to galvanise before bitching out the departed. I know she's difficult, but you like her, right? Her gaze is irresistible. I know she's provoking, but her gaze. Francesca slapped two hands over her face before peering out for my slant. I took time to respond, drawing in slowly on the joint to buy some time before I answered. You performed her, I said, before finally adding, but I am seduced. 
The apartment wasn't going to accommodate many more, so we lifted the mattresses and lay them on walls. The bedding was soiled and perilously close to being unusable, even for me. I squatted in the far east of the apartment over mounds of pre-owned records, trying hard to keep balance from all the peppered mailbag. I had a knack for drinking, no glass of wine or spirit too fatal, but today seemed an exception. I put it down to the dizzying effects of Hungarian pisti. Portishead, Velvet Underground, Nico or Vivaldi, I listed. Franny was distracted by a stray cat that had drifted into the apartment and answered absently. Vivaldi, oh no, 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 Portishead. The stray flopped out into the late afternoon light under the devoted petting of Francesca. With the departure of Britain from the European Union, I could think of no song more fitting than Porter's Head's words. Gibbon's feverish lyrics filled the bare space and political anthem. Oh, can't anyone see? We've got a war to fight. Never found our way, regardless of what they say. <laughs> I can see you mouthing it. Um, Francesca and I lay down side by side on splintered hardwood, staring up at the ceiling. Flakes of white plaster cracked their way up walls, though the ornamental cornices remained intact. I followed the 19th century moulding with my eyes as Francesca's calm, downcast voice whispered the lyrics. How can it feel this wrong from this moment? <laughs> Stop it, Antonia. Stop it, Antonia. <laughs> How can it feel this wrong? That <laughs> I, want, I wanted you to sing, but it's, it's sing. please. We don't want to repulse people. I know that. Um, I know <laughs> that one. That um, that part that I remember listening to it like on the loop when I was a teenager. Right. Like, Non-stop. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Which takes me to maybe a question. Go for it. That is a rec recurrent one um, for um, a lot of people that I talk to that read the book is, um, yeah, I mean, it's a question about, um, uh, you know, there, there is this phrase, I think at the very beginning when you, it's so funny, when you catch her, when you catch her citing Jenny Holzer, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. She quoted me Jenny Holzer, but without citing Jenny Holzer. I wondered how often she gotten away with this. And it's so funny because that happens all the time. So I was wondering how, how did you get away with this? Because right? the book is like filled with quotations, citations, or like uh, little things slid in between the lines. So there is both, I think, there is both um, a question of. Uh, yeah, like quotes, like simply quotes that are at the beginning of the chapters or at the end, and, and, and then there is a question more, uh, maybe we can split it into two. So there is the, the, the quotes, the citing, and what's your feeling about that? And how do you, yeah, how do you relate to this, uh, to, to, to this, um, which is not a technique, it's not the cut, it's not the, um, you know, it's it's not really the the same thing of quoting and citing other authors or music or artists, uh, and then they cut out technique. So yeah, so we talk a bit about that basically. I like that. Um, I suppose it's what you said before about it was kind of a departure point for me this Jenny Holzer situation because that actually this is a fictional work, but that actually did happen. I went to. At Vernissage many many years ago and I was having I met this amazing amazing person and we're having this great conversation and then in the middle of it she kind of interjected with this Jenny Holzer quote not verbatim but almost and I just thought how fantastic she didn't cite Jenny Holzer she kind of just palmed it off as her own work and I was so impressed it was hilarious um, but more than that I was kind of thinking about the way that you know, we kind of acquire all the same cultural capital because I knew this quote. And it started getting me thinking about the way that we kind of all acquire the same cultural playlist and all the same cultural capital. And for me, like, it's, it's a bit of an ironic lampooning of the art world. This whole thing's very tongue in cheek, the way I'm presenting the reader with a list, like a litany of artists and mm -hmm. references that we all know because we're all kind of in this same little insular yeah, contemporary art. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah right. 
Um, yeah, I think, I think you mentioned also about like the cut up style of it. Yeah, but I was thinking about this thing of creating a scene or like being <coughs> suddenly recognizing each other through the quotations or like recognizing each other through the references that we use. Um, that's something that for me at least is very much uh, connected to the idea of teenagehood or like <laughs> adolescence. Because I remember like all through my growing up years, I mean, at that period it was very much about like listening to these songs in a loop or writing down that, um, it, it was a lot about music, but not only, also it could have been about poetry or literature, but having these quotes and these, yeah, these phrases or these quotes that we would write on our diary, but then also maybe on the back of the backpack so that other kids in school could <laughs> catch up and see like, oh my God, yeah, she likes Nirvana. Like this is a Kurt Cobain quotation. So you could relate and you could create, you know, your own, yeah, you could create your own character and like be recognizable as that kind of person. And I think it's something very, uh, that's very much connected to that period of life when one is trying to find these references to grow up and to create your own, yeah, your own character. Mm. And it's funny because I have the feeling that in the, like in the norm, like, what people are supposed to be in life, it's that like at some point you have to grow up and like not do that anymore, you know? You cannot yeah. be like a group, you're like, you cannot be a fan all your life long and like just quoting people that you like and like saying, what kind of music do you like? Oh, it's <laughs> <laughs> You know? Yeah. yeah. I feel this so much through the book, but I love that. Like for me, like it, it's not like that, that you have to grow up and then find your own way or like, uh, develop your own style and otherwise if you're quoting too much maybe it's like um it can be considered as uh, you know like i mean just simply putting putting very simply like stealing or like not having your own thing and um and i think it's just very beautiful that throughout the book you can just uh, i i mean at least i can just very much relate to this um yeah, it's almost like uh, uh, my friend Theo is actually here listening to. I think I see you. <laughs> we're talking about this before, and he was telling me maybe it's a little bit like fan fiction, you know? Yes. You know, yeah, yeah. I didn't realize what what is fan fiction, and then he told me, yeah, you know, like people like writing stories about a character in Star Wars and like developing on the side, you know? And this is very funny that that could be an element in the book, also because of the Pisti character. No, is that fan fiction, Pisti herself? You see what I mean? That she, yeah. just, I mean, you, you, you can tell us. Well, it's kind of like, I, I mean, as soon as you said that, I was kind of thinking about my room when I was an adolescent filled with, um, remember Beverly Hills 90210? I don't know, so no. Much. This is, oh, you do, this is, yeah. There was like team Dylan or team Brandon and I was, I was team Dylan because- I was so- Oh yeah, yeah. I knew you would be, yeah, baby face. But um, no, I liked like the deep furrows in his forehead. And I guess part of PST is that I don't know that we necessarily grow out of asserting those signifiers as part of our identity. Maybe it just changes into a more mature and stable version or maybe, Maybe it changes into a more immature and unstable version. I'm not sure, but um, yeah, I don't know that it changes that much. So I find that that kind of idea hard to speak to because, uh, yeah, to it doesn't. But you see what I mean when I talk about the norm is that it's supposed completely to if you grow out of like you grow, uh, yeah, you grow out of this. But yeah, I never did. So I'm happy to be. To be <laughs> You're still now. growing out. Uh, hopefully it's not, no. But so, yeah, so what about the character Pisti? Because um, I personally didn't read, I feel, I feel so bad about it. So uh, Pisti is supposed to come out uh, from another book. She's a character that's kind of um, borrowed from... Uh, stolen, yeah, stolen, yeah. Um, yeah, she was. Um, Good memory. It actually was, she was stolen or appropriated from, um, Chris Krauss wrote an incredible book called Aliens and Anorexia. And let's be honest, who doesn't want to steal from Chris Krauss? Um, she had mentioned, like, I think it was in the first page or two, this particular 
male character. He was a Hungarian activist, if I'm remembering correctly, in some like theater troupe type thing. It was a really cursory thing. The character came in and then disappeared like three lines later, which I really liked. But I think the thing that really drew me to this Pisti is that for whatever reason, I knew that the Hungarian name Pisti meant victorious. I don't know how I knew that, but I did. And um, so I became really obsessed with this, this name and decided, because I had problems with obsessing over things, um, that I had to create a whole bloody book out of this one character, it's essentially. More space or something. Right. Yeah, that's really funny. And in the process, also moved to another gender. Yeah, abs of course, of course. <laughs> But she, I think, do you remember when we were writing this and I actually think that I had used chromosomal um, replacements for people? Do you remember that? You, and we, you, what? Never mind, it's, it's, it's unhelpful. No, 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 I think it's helpful. I mean, there is a lot of people that, like, I mean, not people necessarily in the book, but I don't know, I think there is a lot of um, uh, hidden um, characters in the book, like uh, the... Cavaliero Cosimo, of course. But then we yeah, of it. course. No, but we skipped, we completely skipped the cut up. The cut up. Uh, yeah, that was a, that for me is a really important part of the work. I mean, I suppose in a way I was incredibly influenced by Jean Jacques Schulz. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, of course, Dusty Pink, because it's a masterpiece. Um, I think for me, more than anything, I wanted to create a kind of like, um, a dizziness or a discombobulation within the text, like almost a frenetic energy more than wanting to create like a strong narrative. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose like, I suppose like it kind of speaks to the whole like cliches and tropes in the, in the, in the art world. I mean, we're having the same conversations repeatedly. There's a lot of, I guess, cheap talk and these cyclical conversations that people have. So for me, this cut up dizzying effect was really important. And I also found it really important that the beginning kind of ties into the end. It's almost like the same thing where this character of Elki is, it's like she's trying to get somewhere, but she never actually arrives in the same way that these characters talk about all these political ruptures and all these ideas um, and nothing ever happens. Like they don't actually do anything about it. They just kind of sit, the whole book is in one apartment except for one section. The whole book is built around Belleville. It's one night, right? The whole book is one night. Yeah, and now. Just a, a one chapter that is uh, the past. Yeah. Something completely else. That would deserve like a whole different talk because I feel like the book is very double. Like it's very, like a, there is like a, a whole mm -hmm. like parenthesis, but that's why you public, you spectators over there, you need to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> plug but yeah yeah so the book takes um, place in paris where the character tries to leave paris to this other destination Trignac, which is also yet another story which is maybe linked to your next project but we'll see that later and so yeah indeed i had a question about paris so in the book uh you described a street that i was very much um uh how can i say that I, that I lived <laughs> through very much. Like the Rue de Belleville was a place where I used to go like uh, every day for uh, many years. So I used to go to a place called Castillo Corrales, which sounds <laughs> close to this uh, uh, Cavaliero <laughs> place that you quote in the book. I wonder, somehow I feel like that there were like a kind of two parallel Parises in which we were both living at the same time, but we never really met. And it's fascinating, yeah, because you talk about things that resonate very much with me, but it's like, it is as if there was like a Rue de Belleville, but with different numbers and that we were living there, but I could never find your number or never like really like uh, uh, buzz your um, inter interphone, you know? Like, yeah. You know. So have you, have, like, have you been there for real? Like, what is it? Like, what's your... Yeah, I think... Um... Yeah, I mean, obviously those, I mean, are you talking about Rue de Belleville or what are you talking about? I'm talking about Belleville, but not just Belleville as a place, but also Belleville as a, a time and space and as a yeah. city, because it's very specific, I think. And um, 
Definitely. I mean, I was there at the time, like, I think, like Paris is almost like a character, I think, in this work. There's, an, there's a kind of like disambiguation with the character of Paris, but also each of the characters in a way. You never quite know if it's real or if it's fictionalised. Like, I mean, even in the way that um, Pisti, like you never even know what nationality she is. Like, is she French? Is she Hungarian? Is she from the Armenian diaspora? Like, everything's a little bit hazy and it, ch it changes and in such a uh, like a disorienting way that that I think Paris is kind of the same. Um, obviously, um, Cavaliero Cosima is Castilla Corolla's, obviously, um, but you know, and the culture rapide is there across the road in a specific scene. And um, but yeah, like I mean, for me, I think the important thing for me about my time in Paris and having to write this is like I'm from a, a really I'm from a really shitty town in Australia, in the middle of nowhere. There's a lot of social issues. There's a lot of drugs. There's, you know, people are getting knocked up at 14 and 15. You're popping morning after pills, like lollies. And then you move into this space where there is so much money in the artist left. And there is so much wealth. And I think I even met people with blue blood. And it was really, it was weird for me because I've never really been around so much affluence. Um, and I suppose it started me, it, it made me start questioning about my life of precariousness and their life of um, precariousness because they look so different. And I think when and you don't... It's bigger and bigger nowadays. The divide is bigger and bigger. It's crazy. Completely. It's crazy. And so it's this weird thing of people articulating themselves in a certain way when they have they have the opportunity to fail. Whereas I feel like there's a lot of people out there that don't have the opportunity to fail mm -hmm. because failure for them means there's no food on the table. There's, the rent won't be paid. Um, so if you're not a trust fund baby or, or being bankrolled by your family to your 35, there is a whole different feeling that you have in Paris because I mean, it's such an exorbitant place to live. I mean, I was living in a tiny little place with amazing people, but it was like a thousand euros for this tiny little room. And yeah, so that for me played a big role, I think, in, in exploring the... But so wh wh when did you actually write? Like, where were you when you wrote the book? Were you like away? Like, uh, was it like, did you, did you move from Paris to Berlin, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I was in Berlin and then I moved to Paris and then back to, I, to be honest, I can't remember exactly where I wrote it. I think I thought a lot about it in Paris. I was doing my PhD, trying to get it into a three year period because I didn't have any, you know, financial opportunities after that. Um, and then maybe I, maybe I wrote it in, in Berlin on that forum, remember? So basically you wrote it on, like uh, you didn't really write it in a place, it feels more like you wrote, write it in a, you wrote it in a, how can I say, like an out, outside of both cities somehow, because uh, this forum thing, I feel it's very much like, yeah. you know, like, like a term. Yeah. I never really thought of, I mean, for people who don't know what we're talking about, um, I had this really stupid idea. Part of the things that I, I, I was thinking about at the time is the way that academic language and the, the heavy jargon that you use in that world and the really verbose language, as well as, you know, in postmodernist writing is really impenetrable to people that don't have a certain level of art school education or are in that academic world. And it, it, I was just like wondering, why am I writing like this in the first place? Like, no one gives a shit. No one's reading this. I'm not making any difference in the world by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and so ironically, I started this space thinking that we would invite people to critique the work as I was writing it and um, share the space for themselves to maybe propose their own ideas and their own work. Um, and the group just got bigger and bigger online. I think it was like 160 people in the end. And there were people from like the world of academia and that had professorships but then inversely there were people that I had worked with in creative writing workshops that were long-term homeless and had drug and alcohol issues and had come out of war-torn countries so the space was completely intimidating and inaccessible for those kinds of people and they complained about it 
But so what was it? It was like a forum. How was it called, for instance? It was, I'm so embarrassed about the name, but it was called, this was 2016, remember? It was called A Manifesto for Disaffected Women. And okay, a manifest of disaffected women. Okay, yeah, anyone could just like uh, join the forum, and uh, there were like, yeah, you, you could join, but like, I think I had like the it's approval. Like forum. Like, I don't know how that works. No, I mean, you know me, I don't know how to turn a computer on, but um, but yeah, it was. I mean, a lot of these people I knew directly, they were friends, and then word spread, and some people really enjoyed um, the participatory type format but in the end no one really wanted to participate because it wasn't a safe environment and understandably so so it was almost like a real-time playing out of the issues that i was dealing with in the text at the same time it was weird publishing so you were publishing the um, the chapters like one by one almost like in the like yeah kind of like a telenovela like it depending on how busy i was it was almost like um like a little baby installation each week mainly because like I don't have a lot of like stamina to write long pieces um yeah and some you were already seeing it like uh in a printed form for later or was it like yeah so you were, you were publishing like um a, um a chapter a week or something like this and people were able to comment on that and like follow yes exactly exactly yeah and I thought there would be um more criticism um there was in a certain way obviously from the people that were saying that they don't feel comfortable with the space and talking about their own ideas because they were intimidated by some of the other participants i, I just didn't think about anything basically i had this really utopian idea that i could combat this this way that i had become so insular um by opening the space up but i just perpetuated the whole issue and that i was dealing with in the first place it was embarrassing but so, no come on <laughs> <laughs> but did you write but so did your writing change like in relation to what people were like do you feel like there was like a because to me it doesn't really feel like a collective work like this book for me it's really like a I mean, this is your book, you know, like, uh, yeah, I love it. it. No one's no, in the end, no one participated. Like people weren't super, but do you know, what's really interesting is that, um, I have never had so many people read a particular work of mine and ask if they were a character, actually exclusively, if they were the character of Pisty, like this hot pre life pre raphlite wave type girl with the, what's it called? The undercut, like the shaved undercut, or they thought they were Franny this almost like this cliched hysterical um, persona, but it was weird how everyone thought that there were these two particular characters. What do you think that speaks to? I don't know which one. <laughs> I would love to be, I would love to be the, um, I would love to be Jean actually. Jean is very sexy. Yeah. Like, He's smoking be... hot, smoking hot. But do you know who's the best is Kit, Kitty, the, the small. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She look, Kitty, she's like, uh, yeah, she looks very wise and she can bake, which is something I admire so much. She can bake and she can do low level activism. This woman is, I mean, she has an endurance that I could never know. Like, amazing. I love her. There is a very, I mean, the book is very, no, I'm not going to say that the book is theatrical because that's like, that doesn't sound good at all. But I love the way that uh, the book is constructed. I mean, I feel like the book is very much constructed through. Um, uh, conversations which is something that I lack very much like now like these days because I cannot stand the online I mean of course we're having a great online conversation but that's not something that I do like uh, very spontaneously you know I just miss like being face to face with like my friends or like people and talk and so this is like a very refreshing read like right now to have these people just talking in a staircase and smoking cigarettes and like not <laughs> how that they're like Cont contaminating each other with like a weird virus so that's a very it's funny how quick these things look so um uh you know like like a like a lost time like a utopian or like something that like a past that it's not possible to live anymore i mean especially here in paris where we have like a mandatory mask even in the streets 
so you cannot even like see if someone is smiling at you or being like a flirtatious you know yeah <laughs> yeah true i didn't think of it yeah i mean to me like i mean just think about it right now like now like having this uh, like you cannot seduce anyone right now in paris so it's really nice to read the <sighs> yeah book who makes you like remember i mean i don't think anyone's seducing anyone in germany so it's not really i don't think i've ever been hit on by a german so i don't think it's really a big issue here but in paris everyone's hitting on people all of the time like it's fabulous that used to be Paris. that's why we're here like uh, it doesn't make sense to be in paris without you know like without sex and uh, like uh, without without um, yeah i mean sensuality in the streets so that's agreed stuff. agreed that stuff this stuff comes back soon again and talking about conversation and like one-to-one -one exchanges i suggest that maybe you can give us like a hint about your um, upcoming new project ah okay yes yes this very one so yep. i'm fascinated by this format so you you were just introducing it to me like yesterday so i don't know much about it but I had, uh, it's kind of like um the, it's in a way i was just thinking it's the inverse of pisti because it was not written with an audience in mind at all it um it's an epistolary exchange with a with sabrina tarasov the art critic um that was i think she was based in she's probably here hi sabrina she was based in um, los angeles at the time and um because i apparently have a weird obsession with trenyak i didn't realize two of my books pivot around Trenyak, because the people are so beautiful. Um, Just for uh, uh, the ones who don't know, Trenyak is a um, place that exists for real in France. <laughs> it's um, uh, uh, like a, a re, 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 how do you say, renewed uh, old factory in the countryside. Um, which region is it? In, in the limits. Corazza, yeah, France, they were saying uh, It's an art space and it's a place for residencies and where, I mean, it's kind of an open space where people can go to and like work on projects or like uh, writing. I have never been to Trignac, so sometimes I wonder if it exists for real or not. I love that. I, you'll never know. Well, it's unbelievable. The people there are just maybe the nicest people in the world, but I met Sabrina. I didn't know Sabrina until we were doing a, a writer's residency there, an artist residency. And we met um, very briefly. She's Swedish and Finnish. So she was telling me about this like Scandinavian tradition where you basically pick different species of wildflowers and then you place them under your pillow on Midsummer's Eve and you dream about your future or your future love or et cetera. And the next morning we were in the kitchen and um, we were kind of like, you know, retelling our dreams. And I had dreamt I met this person, uh, married this person, Kim, who I ended up marrying. And she just had a, she had blank. There was, she had nothing. And um, then like quite a, maybe an hour later, she left the residency quite quickly. And there wasn't really, I didn't know her very well. So there wasn't much of a discussion. And I found out that it, it, it's quite tragic actually um her family have a, a a summer house in the finnish archipelago and um her family were on the lake and there was a boating accident and it took the lives of two of her um, family members and so it was a very very tragic and difficult time obviously um so i had written her uh, like a letter of offering my condolences and from that point it it became like a, I guess what's like going into its fifth year of a correspondence work. Um, and I guess in a way it's an ongoing negotiation on grief um, and in existence, but it's also kind of peppered with our own personal ridiculous woes and, you know, sardonic wit about politics and the art world and stuff. It's not, it's not as heavy as it is coming across, but in a way it is our, in very different circumstances, our own ways of negotiating grief in our own lives. Is that also how you grew to know each other? Or because you just mentioned that you didn't really know her when you were in Trinia together? I mean, you were not close. That's what you say? Yeah, that's it. Like we didn't know each other from a bar of soap. Like, yeah. For another project. You were both there in this residence space and you met each other. And then from then on, you started. Uh, yeah, this uh, 
this conversation through writing. Is that it? Exactly. Like almost a lot, a lot of our relationship um, was negotiated through through writing and this like like sending these emails haphazardly across. Like I think between us, we lived in six different countries or something at at any one time. So there's like lots of um, different spaces and different people and um, different political scenarios and things like that. Um, it's a very meaning, a very meaningful work in a lot of ways, and it's. Um, I think it's quite important to us that it comes together um, well. It's coming out with Moose Publishing in spring next year. Okay, so it's like you have to cut in. How can I say? So in somehow, like you, you, you had this exchange of letters, and then at some point, you, like how, how did that happen? That it just came to you, like it was just visible to you that it was like a, a thing that could be put together and make sense in mm. just one I publish I don't know how it yeah, came you have to stop like you have to stop writing if you decide to publish the letters you have to like you no know, you have to know which one is the last letter basically see what I mean well this is the thing it's like ongoing so it will, hopefully you know it, it will not stop it, it's still ongoing now even though we're kind of like collating the letters there's like hundreds of letters and so we're having to sift through at the moment um, all of this material. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like a lot of it's terrible. Like some of it, I'm so embarrassed. I read it and I think, holy shit, like uh, you don't even realize how terrible things are until like, you know, a year later or something. But also because you called them letters, but they're probably emails or something or not. Are they letters or emails? Well, how did you? They're emails, like we call it letters, but yeah, they're emails. Don't call it, I mean, uh, of course, email is the new letter, right? I mean, it doesn't, like, there, there is nothing wrong about it, I think. But it's just, uh, it's just funny to see how, yeah, how quick it goes. But anyway, do you want to read from one? Yeah, I, I can read from it. Um, I'll read like a more well, funny, well, upbeat section. Um, mm -hmm. So this is like, so Sabrina had said something this week about me not doing anything for her that week. Um, so I wrote her a story to shut her up. And so this is actually from this year, the 13th of April. Dear Sabrina, here's the story I wrote for you. Don't tell me I don't do anything for you. Didn't Seth Price get some hot cha-ching for writing a second-rate story? Fuck Seth Price. Cleo, 448 Psychosis. I had a friend who I liked to tell what I really thought about things or people. Mostly people who were disgustingly enthusiastic about life and around whom I immediately felt superior. Maybe because it seemed like most of the time she'd agree, and if not agree, at least understand. She was the kind of girl who looked like she didn't sweat. She told me I had a large head for a skinny person, like a greyhound or chopper chop. So there's obviously something missing in her, and unquestionably me. Faulty brain synapses perhaps from our four year bout with alcoholism. But it's because of this that neither of us noticed. To me, this gave her credibility. I was jealous of her sunny Los Angeles. It gave her an advantage in life. All that vitamin D, Botox, favors from Silicon Valley, superfoods and anorexia. But it was also true that Berlin had abbreviated itself over the past several years. Galitzer Park's uh, speed pushers, weed dealers, patchouli and vigilantes had been nudged out by yellow unisex visors and frisbees, kites and seagulls, which is to say good riddance Berlin drumming circles. I despise being in circles just generally, in the middle of them, on the edge of them, all of it. I hated introducing myself in theatres of the round with declarations of na nationality and one fun fact, because my idea of fun fact is to others personal atrophy. It had been a busy week for her, ticking non-gendered or full-blooded Seuss boxes on art funding applications so she'd have the marginalised advantage. She was a fraud and I was pretty supportive of it. That type of fraudry makes people way less judgmental and put me at ease with my own secret revelations. There's few people who won't judge you for pasting fake tattoos in nautical themes on your three month old newborn. And equally reassuring is knowing that there are other people on earth as shitty as you. She didn't know about a lot of things, prefab houses, for example, or confessional boots or dangerous wildlife, things I knew a lot about. I told her I was writing a new book with nine short essays. 
An ode to Salinger, I told her, before admitting nine was just a modest number and I'd relinquished delusional ambitions some time ago. Around the time I realised I didn't have any talent in life, mostly just the ability to make small nods to people that had actual talent. I didn't mind. I had lots of ideas for career paths that I floated by her. Confused aspirations, but still solid options. Private eye, sous chef, porn star, Navy SEAL, career job seeker on benefits, but I guess that's basically the same as artist. She didn't have a shred of sanity, so I knew she'd humour me and my half-baked ideas. We'd toast to almost everything. It was a Tuesday night when she rang. Arthur Russell's A Little Lost was playing in the background, which always reminded me of the time I slept with my boyfriend's friend in Copenhagen and then tried to cover it up. My childhood nemesis called me a slut every day for years, even when I was a virgin, so I figured since I had the reputation, I should probably make the most of it. I would have been pretty happy to take it to the grave, but Zuckerberg double-crossed me. I've since gotten over it. The Zuckerberg bit, not the cover-up. A moment later, she'd sprung into action. It was over Skype, so I saw her leave the room looking cute in a golden Dolce & Gabbana dress worth a cool 3K that she'd scored for 40 bucks. Not because she paid for it, just the cost of the Uber getaway all the way back to Pasadena. She disappeared for a good 12 minutes, came back without justifying her absence and started talking to herself more than me. But I had Pringles, so I didn't really mind. I listened through crunches of salt and vinegar, missing a third or maybe half of what she said. It was an uncivilized hour in Berlin, but it wasn't accounted for in the conversation, which required stacks of concentration and a nimble leap from salt and vinegar Pringles to soft and then hard liquor. <laughs> She was, she was deep in the dumps writing a diary entry for Art Forum without getting any kudos for it. A ghost blow job for an artist who wanted the authorship credit and an editor who didn't mind. An ethical merry-go-round hard to get off in the art world. Luckily, she was the daughter of a street light and cinnamon bun, which is to say she was sweet but harsh and confronted people easily, which went a long way in the art world. She said something to the editor like, if I die and my name isn't in there, I'm going to be really angry. And if I die and my name is in there, I'm going to be really angry, just not at you. Her ethics were impeccable, but then again, your ethics don't actually matter when you're hot and a genius. She was a genius, sure, but I was ingenious, though my friends called it Machiavellian. So I had more experience getting what I wanted in ways that were unconventional, which is why she called me in the first place. She was privileged the task of applying for sizable funding to pay related costs to review FIAC art fair. Flights, crack motel, haircut, retinol, money to research the article, to write the article, and then scratch her face out in the photograph. The artist getting the credit was also a tenured professor at CUNY, with 76 articles and six books to his name that his research assistants wrote on smart drugs like modafinil from their nine-person chairhouse in Skid Row. It was a routine story in the art world, so I could multitask. Loads of tabs open on my computer, shopping for majesty palms online, buying books by Donna Haraway, researching dictionary meanings for words in books by Donna Haraway. While she made good points, I watched her flatmate Keki float around in the background looking ill but sexy, like a picture of a serial killer on his deathbed. It was one of the reasons I started the pen pal program at San Quentin. Life. I was obviously not in command of the situation. In addition to ethical issues, hers was a cash flow problem, since the tenured academic and his combustible hairdo would get the favoured percentage of the agreed upon fee, and she the remnant, which was probably just enough to reimburse that Uber ride. She had his contact details saved in her phone as Dialogod, but wasn't terribly committed to answering the Lord. The professor was attached to his phone tuned into his ringtone like it was his son, since his underlings were scoring him hot authorships and publications in A-plus peer reviews and modest returns from all the art crits his name had been commissioned, which I guess was his side gig and kept his readership broad. I took a covert screenshot of our Skype call. Maybe I'd make an artwork out of it. Keki would be the surprising ghost you sometimes find in the background of photos, a talky background ghost kvetching his crummy existence in some cringy Los Angelian vernacular I couldn't know. I tuned him out at Gnarly or any other street slang that ruined his sexy serial killer vibes 
and watched him eat a pricey grapefruit like the surveillance camera that I was. He was studying supernova and neutron stars at UCLA, though I was yet to understand how that was going to be useful. Keki wasn't in our conversation, but thought he was, and tipping his grapefruit spoon to the camera lied, oh, I'll be back, before sliding out of the room playing harmonica. She asked me what I thought of the whole charade, whether or not to debase herself, whether or not she should spar for authorship, and a few other things I accidentally crunched Pringles over. I went straight to the voice of authority that comes to me after 2 a.m. saying something like, if you don't do it, there's plenty of those enthusiastic types that would and for free, which wasn't really an answer, but it was best anyone, anyone could do in their pajamas. She looked unconvinced, so I told her by the time I'd work in the next morning, I'd have a solution. I don't think she believed me, but I was a woman of my word and enjoyed making life really difficult for myself. It's how I dated my ex so long. My answers for myself were pretty uncompromising, but I was too out of shape to advise others and just generally unseaworthy. I found simple life practicalities difficult to navigate, once getting myself trapped behind one of those little tray tables on the plane. But I wanted to be helpful. I flapped around trying to find the book I'd been reading, a quote I'd underlined in Natasha Stagg's surveys. Maybe that'd be helpful or not but my apartment had become the Bermuda Triangle since I'd had a kid and I couldn't find it anywhere. I Googled it quickly and read it out to her like I'd memorized it verbatim. People who watch and do not want to be watched. People who listen and do not want to talk. People who live vicariously are just perverts and no one should want them around. She was listening, but also flipping through the San Fran Chronicle, eventually saying, what's that supposed to mean? I told her I didn't know and we moved on. We bitched about life for a while, complaints about our finances, the art world, climate change, Jehovah's Witnesses, our careers, the false bottom in academia, all whilst eating reckless foods and scheming up our next book collaboration that would rewrite the history of 18th century pirates through a feminist lens and be undeniably brilliant. Her very distant aunt on her mother's side, Anne Bonny, the daughter of an Irish servant girl, had been a pirate of the Caribbean during the 18th century. She was very proud of her mother's side. Anne was illegitimate, so her father disguised her as a boy, Andy, and put him to work as a lawyer's clerk. Lawyers often become pirates, I'm told. It was all very cliche, the red hair, the fiery temper, yada, yada, yada. And the story culminates, if my friend's version is to be believed, at the Beatles' hip hop song, My Body Lies Over the Ocean. A delicious piece of pop culture baklava, but whether or not I actually believe this changes from day to day. We swung wildly on ropes from buccaneer piracy to art writing piracy, where we'd remain for the rest of the night. I had a distinct slackening of interest in the art world that had made life pretty easy. I wasn't stymied in its asthmatic shrubs and had an intractable position on the whole affair. But unfortunately, people don't always want to know what you think, even when they ask you what you think. You've got to be able to tell the difference. She'd reject the contract if she had any integrity at all. But passing it on made her complicit in a whole other way. Keki was now back in the frame, eavesdropping like an underfed watchdog with the moral code of Nelson Mandela, and would have said his piece if my friend took on the article and fed the machine. Knowing this, she changed the subject abruptly. Life was humiliating enough. Everyone's having kids. It's disgusting. Eleventh hour kids, which is even worse. I hope to catch HPV so I don't have to get my tubes tied. The change of topic was obvious, even to a person wearing hibiscus flowers at 10 a.m. I said something in thinly veiled code like, get HPV, don't get HPV, it's all the same in the end, but one of those is much easier to live with. She nodded like she'd understood and Keki looked approving in the background, announcing his departure for his weekly dumpster dive gleaning rotting fruit and the occasional rosehip oil from health food city. Our version of dumpster diving wasn't as romantic, but you've got to take what you can get. You're right, she said, I'll take the gig. And besides, there's always San Fran Bridge. Said to. Wow. Whoa. What? That's not a letter. That's another story. <laughs> <laughs> It's not a letter. It's not a letter. <laughs> it's not a letter. The portrait of Sabrina. I think in some ways, I mean, I, 
in some ways, definitely. She's just incredible. She's this wonderful brain. She's just, she's incredible. Um, but certainly none of those other, you know, other moments, you know, happen. She obviously, um, oh no, the, someone's messaging at the same time. It's hard to. Oh, can they see that? Hey, guys. I don't know. I can see people saying messages at the same time. Oops. Okay, maybe it's the way I set up the thing, but I think it's like it's all for good, no? There won't be. That, yeah. Well. I mean, anyway, you girls were saying, oh, sorry, I, I like now I'm. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize that there was a chat room open. <laughs> Neither did I. But yeah, um, the 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 work will come out. We're working on it at the moment. It will hopefully be finished by February, March. Um, so we'll see. Hopefully that, I hope no one's listening to this from Moose, but yeah, it'll be done and it'll be out in spring. So we'd love to do a reading with, um, with you guys. It would be so good to, to be able to do like a real thing, like for real, you know, real life. Yes. Like, yes. Like smelling and like... <laughs> <laughs> Did you say smelling? Yeah, smelling. I miss the smell of people around. <laughs> Not about me you. right now. You don't, you know, like you don't... <laughs> I've been wearing the same thing for like four days. I don't think you're going to miss the, the smell, that's yeah. for sure. Yeah. I don't yeah. miss shopping clothes so much, but I definitely miss like sweat and like, like, you know, like talking to each other too close and being like, I like too close. Like, all these things. Anyway, yeah, I love that, that letter and the text. It's just a lot of things coming. So I don't think I have like a question for that, but. Um, I think I, I love how you smash the academia and uh, it's a good portrait not only of Sabrina but of all of us and at this moment where everyone is so precariously trying to live with these gigs you know like these gigs yeah with the computer at any time of time of day and night just trying not like, to scrap stuff ah it's crazy yeah, yeah so it really is so next time, let's do this in person and you can eat your chips, which I saw you eating your own salt and vinegar chips. You really made me want to have yeah. <laughs> having this like organic crisps, so they're okay. But it's not Pringles. They're organic, so that's good. Well, prefer Pringles. Darling, thank you so much for all this. Thank um, you so much for having me. It was lovely. You take time like to focus and uh, I'm so happy that people are still taking the time to write. You know, like, and not just being in their little bubble at home and like trying to survive through all these crazy things that are happening. So, yeah, so good to have you here. Thank uh, you for having me, and I look forward to seeing you in Paris with a renewed visa very soon. Thank you to everybody who joined. Thank you for coming, everyone. I don't know where the thing is, but thank you so much for. Uh, yeah, so that's a spells book with beautiful uh, scanned oysters on the cover. You can find it here in Paris. I mean, in many bookshops through the world, even if half of them are closed by now, but uh, please reach us online if you want to read more. And uh, yeah, thank you again. Love it, Stal. Bisous, a bientôt. Very, very soon. Bye. See you guys. Thanks everyone. Bye.